truly incredible editorial in the London Times explained the central banker's attitude towards Lincoln's greenbacks. If this mischievous financial policy, which has its origins in North America, shall become indurated down to a fixture, then that government will furnish its own money without cost. It will pay off debts and be without debt. It will have all the money necessary to carry on its commerce. It will become prosperous without precedent in the history of the world. The brains and wealth of all countries will go to North America. That country must be destroyed or it will destroy every monarchy on the globe. The scheme was effective, so effective that the next year, 1863, with federal and Confederate troops beginning to mass for the decisive battle of the Civil War, and the Treasury in need of further congressional authority to issue more greenbacks, Lincoln allowed the bankers to push through the National Bank Act. These new national banks would operate under a virtual tax-free status and collectively had the exclusive monopoly power to create the new form of money, banknotes. Though greenbacks continued to circulate, their numbers were not increased. But most importantly, from this point on, the entire U.S. money supply would be created out of debt by bankers buying U.S. government bonds and issuing them for reserves for banknotes. As historian John Kenneth Galbraith explained it. In numerous years following the war, the federal government ran a heavy surplus. It could not, however, pay off its debt, retire its securities, because to do so meant there would be no bonds to back the national banknotes. To pay off the debt was to destroy the money supply. Later in 1863, Lincoln got some unexpected help from Tsar Alexander II of Russia. The Tsar, like Bismarck in Germany, knew what the international money changers were up to and had steadfastly refused to let them set up a central bank in Russia. If America survived and was able to remain out of their clutches, the Tsar's position would remain secure. If the bankers were successful at dividing America, and giving the pieces back to Great Britain and France, both nations under control of their central banks, eventually they would threaten Russia again. So the Tsar gave orders that if either England or France actively intervened and gave aid to the South, Russia would consider such action as a declaration of war. He did the same with part of his Pacific fleet and sent them to port in San Francisco. Lincoln was re-elected the next year, 1864. Had he lived, he would surely have killed the National Bank's money monopoly extracted from him during the war. On November 21, 1864, he wrote a friend the following. The money power preys upon the nation in times of peace and conspires against it in times of adversity. It is more despotic than monarchy, more insolent than autocracy, more selfish than bureaucracy. Shortly before Lincoln was murdered, his former Secretary of Treasury, Salmon P. Chase, bemoaned his role in helping secure the passage of the National Banking Act only one year earlier. My agency in promoting the passage of the National Banking Act was the greatest financial mistake in my life. It has built up a monopoly which affects every interest in the country. On April 14, 1865, 41 days after his second inauguration and just five days after Lee surrendered to Grant at Appomattox, Lincoln was shot by John Wilkes Booth at Ford's Theater. Bismarck, Chancellor of Germany, lamented the death of Abraham Lincoln. The death of Lincoln was a disaster for Christendom. There was no man in the United States great enough to wear his boots. I fear that foreign bankers, with their craftiness and torturous tricks, will entirely corrupt the exuberant riches of America and use it systematically to corrupt modern civilization. They will not hesitate to plunge the whole of Christendom into wars and chaos in order that the earth should become their inheritance. Bismarck well understood the money changers' plan. 
Allegations that international bankers were responsible for Lincoln's assassination surfaced in Canada 70 years later in 1934. Gerald G. McGeer, a popular and well-respected Canadian attorney, revealed this stunning charge in a five-hour speech before the Canadian House of Commons, blasting Canada's debt-based money system. Remember, it was 1934, the height of the Great Depression, which was ravaging Canada as well. McGeer had obtained evidence deleted from the public record, provided to him by Secret Service agents at the trial of John Wilkes Booth, after Booth's death. McGeer said it showed that Booth was a mercenary working for the international bankers. According to an article in the Vancouver Sun of May 2nd, 1934, Abraham Lincoln, the martyred emancipator of the slaves, was assassinated through the machinations of a group representative of the international bankers who feared the United States president's national credit ambitions. There was only one group in the world at that time who had any reason to desire the death of Lincoln. They were the men opposed to his national currency program and who had fought him throughout the whole Civil War on his policy of greenback currency. Interestingly, McGeer claimed that Lincoln was assassinated not only because international bankers wanted to reestablish a central bank in America, but because they also wanted to base America's currency on gold, gold they controlled. In other words, put America on a gold standard. Lincoln had done just the opposite by issuing U.S. notes, greenbacks, which were based purely on the good faith and credit of the United States. The article quoted McGeer as saying, They were the men interested in the establishment of the gold standard and the right of the bankers to manage the currency and credit of every nation in the world. With Lincoln out of the way, they were able to proceed with that plan and did proceed with it in the United States. Within eight years after Lincoln's assassination, silver was demonetized and the gold standard money system set up in the United States. Not since Lincoln has the U.S. issued debt-free United States notes. These red seal bills, which were issued in 1963, were not a new issue from President Kennedy, but merely the old greenbacks reissued year after year. In another act of folly and ignorance, the 1994 Regal Act actually authorized the replacement of Lincoln's greenbacks with debt-based notes. In other words, greenbacks were in circulation in the United States until 1994. Why was silver bad for the bankers and gold good? Simple. Because silver was plentiful in the United States. It was very hard to control. Gold was, and always has been, scarce. Throughout history, it has been relatively easy to monopolize gold, but silver has historically been 15 times more plentiful. With Lincoln out of the way, the money changers' next objective was to gain complete control over America's money. This was no easy task. With the opening of the American West, silver had been discovered in huge quantities. On top of that, Lincoln's greenbacks were generally popular. Despite the European Central Bankers' deliberate attacks on greenbacks, they continued to circulate in the United States, in fact, until a few years ago. According to historian W. Cleon Skousen, Right after the Civil War, there was considerable talk about reviving Lincoln's brief experiment with the constitutional monetary system. Had not the European Money Trust intervened, it would have no doubt become an established institution. It is clear that the concept of America printing her own debt-free money sent shockwaves throughout the European central banking elite. They watched with horror as Americans clamored for more greenbacks. They may have killed Lincoln, but support for his monetary ideas grew. On April 12, 1866, nearly one year to the day of Lincoln's assassination, Congress went to work at the bidding of the European central banking interests. It passed the Contraction Act, authorizing the Secretary of the Treasury to begin to retire some of the greenbacks in circulation and thereby contract the money supply. 
Authors Theodore R. Thorin and Richard F. Warner explained the results of the money contraction.